I was the son of a farm worker in uh, central Washington state. My father uh, worked on an apple orchard. Um, we were poor, um, and I grew up in a very conservative area of eastern Washington, um, John Birch Society type area. Um, I grew up believing in the domino theory, stopping communism, uh, that there was patriotic duty to serve in the military. Um, and, uh, you know, also I was thinking about getting married when I, I soon when I graduated and, uh, I thought it was my only chance to go to college. Uh, there was no other way I was going to be going to college unless I could use the GI bill. And also my only chance that I thought that I had of maybe buying a home. And, uh, so, uh, um, I went to Vietnam and, 1969. I was there from 1969 to 70. Uh, when I first got there, uh, the Army lost me for a little bit. Um, so I was talking to a Vietnamese soldier. Um, we were in a bar. Um, and uh, anyway, we were talking about Vietnamese, um, you know, what I thought of the Vietnamese culture. And I said, I don't know, you know, we don't really have much to do with the Vietnamese personally, you know. So he invited me to his home and I actually lived with that Vietnamese family for a little bit. And uh, that just blew me away. Uh, that just totally blew me away. The hospitality and the kindness, you know, was just amazing because we were taught uh, that uh, the Vietnamese were less than human. And uh, we were taught names for them, which I'm not going to speak right now. Uh, that we call the Vietnamese. Um, and, uh, but I soon found out that, uh, that they were living under a military dictatorship. And uh, so um, I started some cracks in my belief system and uh, cracks that continued on. And so I continued my military, my uh, time over there. Uh, I was with the 362nd uh, Signal Battalion uh, after uh, they found me again. Um, um, I was sent to the Central Highlands uh, up in uh, on K, uh, Second Corps, uh, um, and eventually uh, I was stationed on a two thousand foot high mountain out in the jungle. Um, there was a, a total of forty five of us up there uh, on the mountain top. Uh, that's all. And uh, they had a communications equipment, blinking light, red light, so the jets wouldn't run into us. Uh, but it was kind of like, here we are, here we are, here we are. Um, and uh, so we had the, at nighttime, we owned the top of the mountain, mountain and the BC and the North Vietnamese Army on the rest of the mountain. Um, kind of a scary situation. Uh, but anyway, uh, going back to what Danny was talking about, and uh, when I was in Vietnam, I would say in my units, the units I was with, I would estimate a good 60, maybe even 70 percent were uh, anti-war and uh, against the military, against the war, and uh, against what our country was doing, and definitely against the Army. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a real battle with Army discipline. Uh, there, uh, honestly, uh, there was really a breakdown uh, then and when we got back on uh, military discipline. Um, we were a band of brothers. Um, there were no women in our unit, so I'll say a band of brothers. And uh, we were mainly concerned about getting home alive and making sure that our friends and the, uh, our brothers got home alive. Um, and, that's, and we were fighting to do that. Um, because a lot of us were against the war and we were against the man, the system. We we're against the lifers, military careerists, and uh, we we're against our country at that time because we've been lied to. Uh, most of us were under 21 years old. Uh, we resisted uh, the military, uh, the war, and our country every way we could. Uh, some of the there we can go on. We'll go on later in about more ways. But you know, on our helmets, almost ever, uh, most of us had FTA written on our helmets. 
which uh, stands for fuck the army. And uh, there's such a breakdown in discipline that nobody did anything about that. Because some people wouldn't follow orders or you'd do something wrong and that a senior NCO or an officer would uh, would uh, try to dress you down and you just say, fuck you. What are you going to do? Send me to Vietnam? I'm out here. There ain't nothing worse you can do to that. So from there, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Thank you, brother. Dan, thank, thank you. So l l listening to you, Dan, I, I, I'm reminded of the fact of how young so many people were and you were one of those young people are barely a year or two out of high school. Um, I, you, it certainly know that, the, that there is no reason to believe that the, you could have or should have had a complete understanding of that war. Uh, and that's one of the things I encountered. I, in fact, was a little different. I was a few years older. I was at the wise old age of 25 when I got drafted, which was about five years older than the average uh, person that, that was drafted as you were, Dan. And uh, I had done a lot of reading uh, and I knew that the war was a lie. Um, I went to, I just completed medical school and the internship and I had a residency all lined up at Boston City Hospital. And then I got drafted and it was the height of the war in 1969 because they needed battalion level um, medical personnel rather than more in, uh, significantly trained uh, physicians for the hospitals uh, that were there. They had enough of, enough of those. Um, six weeks of basic training at uh, Fort Sam Houston and I find myself in the late summer of 1969 uh, in, in Vietnam. And I'm sent up to I-Corps uh, and essentially to become a field doctor with an infantry battalion of the 101st Airborne Division, where in fact some of the most fierce fighting of the entire war had been taking place and, and continued to take place. Um, a little bit about the area that we were in. Um, it was an area that historically was absolutely uh, a, a, a part of the Viet Minh colonial, anti-colonial uh, uh, war with the French. Uh, it remained that way, uh, uh, overwhelmingly in support of the National Liberation Front. And then, of course, uh, coming out of Laos and in the Triple Canopy and in the Annamite Mountains, you had uh, large numbers of North Vietnamese regular army. And we were put out on fire bases uh, in the area where there were remaining villages. And I want to say remaining because over a course of three or four years before uh, these villages were uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, people were uprooted. There was a war against the land itself and you created a refugee culture back along, along the coast. Um, I, I arrived at, uh, at a fire base. Uh, those in the army would know that there were four platoons about a, a battalion level, um, 800, uh, there are about the, uh, four companies, about 800 infantry, um, and that broke down into squads and a medical contingent of, of physician, a barely trained uh, physician, and, uh, and, and 16 corpsmen who were remarkable in terms of their courage and bravery and, 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 and commitment. Um, what did we see when I got, by the time we got there, this again was in 1969, the war had been going for four years. And you very quickly learned that you uh, were judged by which side were you on. Were you on the side of the grunt that essentially was being used as cannon fodder? The, cult, the culture, and it was a corrupt field grade officer culture where every six months they rotated lieutenant colonels, the head of the battalion, uh, 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 because that was the only way you could uh, achieve the pathway to promotions for careerists. Um, and the currency was body counts, whether it was the remaining villages that were there or whether it was uh, in, the, uh, in the triple canopy where we were, uh, didn't belong and, and, and were there, uh, it was body counts. And in order to have body counts, you essentially had canaries in the mine shaft, which were us. And, Less, not me per se, because I was at the fire base, but it was these 18, 19, 20, 20, 21 year olds that, had, that were basically being chewed up and spit out. And 
um, and, and, and the kid that you saw in the morning that was lifted in a helicopter out not more than one or two or three kilometers away um, came back in a body bag and pejoratively we were saying just as a way of dealing with it, bag him and tag him and get him home. And that was what was going on when we were there and what was going on for countless rotations and the rhythm of this war for months and years prior to that. And there was no end in sight, um, in addition to the con ongoing destruction. Um, it was a great relief uh, to the average uh, 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 infantry grunt in the in there that there was some there there was support from the medical side because we the first resistance were how do we shut down these daily missions uh, which essentially uh, again the currency is body counts uh, uh, theirs in uh, Vietnamese and, and American um, and we were the first line to be able to do that and we did that with some degree of success, but with an extraordinary degree of conflict with brass and some ethical conflict. If you take out too many people because they're showing up at first light because uh, at, the, at the medical tent, I've got a headache, I've got diarrhea, I've got fever, I've, I've got aches, I, I can't go out on this mission. Uh, you, if you can get enough of them off, you can shut down the mission, uh, which is a victory. But what if you can't? then you've got a depleted group out and others are being jeopardized in a very dangerous situation. And so the ethical conflicts were, 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 were never ending and, and extraordinary. And that was one of the resistance. The second kind of resistance was essentially really an agreement. Um, this is search and avoid uh, at this point. Uh, and when we found second lieutenants, they were platoon. Um, they, had, they, they, they had led platoons or captains, companies that were sympathetic to that. Um, you essentially would go into the bush and you would uh, uh, essentially, you, 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 would, you would blend into the triple canopy and come back and everybody would be fine and there'd be no destruction. Uh, you didn't always find uh, officers that supported that, but when you did, that was part of the support. And uh, then you had the field grade officers that were highly aggressive. Um, and, and that's where the trouble began. And Dan can speak to this, I think, uh, from some of his experience. That's where you saw the extreme end of resistance, where they had to be taken out. Um, and uh, there were other forms of resistance. Uh, um, what we call Vietnam gold was ubiquitous. Uh, and so, People basically needed, you, you know, you were you were strung out on dry, on, on on grass and 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 and, uh, and 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 the insanity of the whole situation almost re, re required that. Um, the uh, and then so you found both personal level resistance, small group level resistance um, uh, that would not participate in follow orders. Um, and, 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 and many people just said, I am refusing to go to the field, either individually or a small group collectively. Send me down to LBJ, uh, Long Bin Jail, which was the in-country in jail for, for uh, uh, refusing to go to the field and, and, and follow orders. Uh, and that was always happening. Um, and uh, at, at the level of where we were or others, uh, in that resistance out there, the level of the anger and the uh, with field grade officers uh, were, were palpable. And the the and and I found myself transferred from one fire base to a more dangerous fire base and to a more dangerous fire base because I, I ended up being labeled as uh, as uh, as a resistor and uh, and someone in opposition to uh, military tactics. Um, I, so I, I, I think, you know, at the extreme end, and we talked about this, and, and, and Danny talked about this, uh, there was, uh, it, 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 it was a matter of life and death, and it was a matter of self-defense in some cases. Um, uh, very complicated series of issues that in the lifetime, uh, I've never been able yet to sort out in, 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 in what that all meant. Uh, let me turn it back to Danny because I think he had a few more thoughts here. I, I would like to close with my, some 
some, some observations I had when I came back home from Vietnam with one or two things, because I, I could illustrate some very, very important racial differences in how resistance took place. So let me turn this over back to Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, both Bob and uh, Danny um, have uh, touched on the ultimate resistance, and uh, that was bragging. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, bragging refers to a fragmentation grenade, which leaves no fingerprints. So, as Bob also indicated, we were in an insane environment. And in order, we were young, uh, in order to survive, uh, we pretty much had to go insane. We actually live and mentally survive living in such insanity. Um, so, I'm going to give you, everybody that's listening, a scenario that might help you understand this extreme resistance. So as I talked before, it's a band of brothers. You're all trying to get home. You want your friends and your buddies to get home too. You know, you love them. Um, so somebody comes along, uh, either field grade, officer, or a second lieutenant, um, and say you're in a squad, uh, infantry squad, I'll use as an example, uh, where there's maybe 12 men, you know, and you're ordered to go out and do something that you've done before. You know that it's going to get people killed. You know it, you know it, you know it, it has happened. And you know, and you're ordered to do this by, say, a second lieutenant or first lieutenant who has some fresh over, you know, fresh off the plane to Vietnam. He wants to, he wants to advance his career. He wants uh, to be self-grandizing. He maybe even wants to get a medal, you know, that would, that would advance his career tremendously, you know. Um, so he's willing to put people in danger because he doesn't know what he's doing. He won't listen to the sergeant who is trying to tell him that you can't do this, we've done this, right? And you know that tomorrow, probably out of the 12, out of your 12 very dear close friends, three of them to five of them are probably going to die. And you're, you have a chance of dying. So your choice boils down to, does one person die? Or just three to five of your best friends. Uh, I just want to make the following point: when I when when I came back, I was drafted for two years. I had a year in Vietnam, and and I have to finish up after leaving, and I get assigned to Fort Meade, Maryland, um, uh, and uh, which was the first Army base, a huge Army base, about twenty miles outside of Washington, Laurel, Maryland. And one of the things that was absolutely astounding, uh, and this was in the very last couple of months of, uh, 20, of 1970, um, was a section of Fort Meade called the Special Processing Battalion. And what this battalion were, a bunch of barracks segregated off from everything else, surrounded by barbed wire, high level barbed wire. It looked like a concentration camp. It was a concentration camp. And what this was were for deserters. And they were several thousand, almost exclusively black Afro-Americans that were now rounded up and put into the Fort Meade Special Processing Battalion. Uh, and uh, the, the, the exact number, I, I can't remember, uh, uh, but it was several thousand. And this, this took the form of resistance in the black community. Uh, you were drafted, you went to basic training, you got your orders to go to Vietnam, and they said, no way am I going, and they take off, and they back to their homes in Philadelphia, or in Newark, um, Camden, Baltimore, Washington, and then the Army goes in, finds them, picks them up, and brings them back, and puts them into the Special Processing Battalion for 
some kind of adjudication of their desertion status. And that basically voting with their feet. And what was so apparent, because it was the it, it was exclusively Afro-American, I remember, um, was that if you were white and you were college educated, you had many routes to get out of that. Um, some of that obviously was you never got out of graduate school. You just stayed in, stayed in, stayed in, and, and out and waited out the war. Um, conscientious objector status, you had access to lawyers, to the arguments. In 1970, Supreme Court ruled you could do this on not just religious grounds, but moral and ethical grounds. Um, they were in position to try to do that. And, um, uh, uh, and, and all these ways, which were more draft dodging than deserting. Um, Afro-American Afro um, uh, 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 drafted into, you know, men did not have that option and they could only vote with their feet and they found themselves in this special process with the battalion. I do not know uh, the, what eventually happened to them, but the judgments against them almost certainly were far more uh, uh, severe than the draft dodging judgments that came to people that also were making choices by conscience in, in many cases, in most cases, perhaps. But um, but there was a, a, a classic disparity there. Um, when I got back in uh, in 1970, I was stationed in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, um, and uh, I was in a unit. Uh, the 11th Signal Brigade, uh, which uh, was almost exclusively Vietnam veterans. Our whole unit were all Vietnam veterans. And uh, we were training as a quick strike communication force. Uh, we were training in the desert uh, so that we could be deployed rapidly into the Middle East in 1971, 72. Uh, and so we were training in the desert. Uh, and uh, so you just survived a war, you spent a year in the jungle, and you come home, and you're happy, and the next thing you know, you're sleeping in tents and eating sea rations in the fucking desert. So, um, as you probably could understand, the morale was out the bottom. And what I was talking about, military discipline, and um, and resistance uh, to uh, the war, resistance to the military, resistance to uh, the lifers, resistance to the country, and the anger was unbelievable. Uh, just one thing that would il illustrate it very well is every morning we had a morning formation, and anybody in the military is familiar with that. That's where you stand at attention. Uh, the, the, the first sergeant and the commanding officer come out and tell you everything that's uh, important and line out the day and all that. So uh, you stand there at attention. Well, uh, in 1970 and 71, we didn't stand at attention. We smoked our cigarettes and we had our hands in our pocket. And when they come out, somebody would yell, hey, biggie, biggie, biggie. Right. And, uh, you know, because the thing of it is, there was the, see, there was the first sergeant and uh, the CO there, but there were 45 men there that were brothers. And if they tried to press charges against anybody, 45 men would say, I'm sorry, that's not the way it was. This guy had it in for him for weeks. Right. And that didn't happen at all like that. Right. And so, again, there was a complete breakdown in discipline, um, you know, and there, there was it was a total breakdown in discipline, you know, um, and uh, GI uh, disrespect for the Army, senior NCOs, on and on. You know, it's, this is going to be up to future historians, but, uh, you know, Bob touched on it and also Danny touched on it, but... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, what led to an all-volunteer army in 1973 was what happened with us Vietnam veterans when we got back. There was no military left. And uh, I, I, I want to say one thing. I'm in favor. I'm in favor of 
a draft. I'm in favor of a draft where nobody gets out of it. Because as long as it's poor people trying to go to college and buy a home that are in our military, then we fight these wars for 19, 20 years all over the world. But when it's the senator's sons and it's other people, and when it's the whole nation going to war and their sons and daughters going to war, we don't fight these wars. We don't fight these wars. We don't do this. We figure out another way. So anyway, um, that's my time. What I got to say. Thank you.